Hey everybody, this is Cherry. Hey, just wanted to spend a few minutes with you and talk about just the basics of CPAP, what it is and why we would use it. Okay, so CPAP is, it stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. Okay, what it isn't is it doesn't ventilate. Okay, so Continuous positive airway pressure means we're adding a little pressure, little pressure into the airway. This is not the same as positive pressure ventilations. Those happen with the BVM. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the difference, but my, I've noticed a few of my students have gotten a little bit um, confused about this. They see the positive pressure and the next thing they want to associate with that is ventilations. So understand that um, this is different and it is a really cool tool. Okay, here's the coolest thing about it. It is an EMT skill in most states. Now I'm going to tell you this is a game changer. It's a game changer for EMS providers but it is really a game changer for our patients. A lot of the patients that used to be in respiratory distress or even maybe respiratory failure, um, got intubated and placed on a ventilator. Um, a lot of those patients now, we place a simple CPAP mask on them. It's a simple skill and they get better before we get to the hospital. And so this is a game changer. Let's talk about it. All right, so we know what it doesn't do. It does not ventilate our patient, but it does add a slight pressure into the mask. Now you can see the mask on this young man. Um, and our body inhales and exhales to balance to the atmospheric pressure. So the, the pressure in the air around us is what our body is always trying to balance to. So this mask, we put it on their face. It seals nice and snug. You can see there's a whole harness that holds that into a nice snug fit on their face. So we have to use the right size mask, okay? Um, and then we put a little pressure in that mask. Now that changes the atmospheric pressure for that patient. So it changes the way our body balances the air pressure in our lungs. Okay, this is kind of a game changer. It's a simple concept, but who didn't think about it? Okay, so when we increase the pressure of the atmospheric pressure or that pressure outside our patient's airway, that pressure balances. So it therefore increases the pressure in the airway. So that increased pressure goes down the trachea, down the bronchial tubes, and eventually moves, in, not eventually, fairly quickly, moves into the alveoli. So if those alveoli are collapsed and closed, sort of pops them open. Um, if it has water in them, which a lot of them do, it will push that water out because there's more pressure in the air sac, the alveoli, than there is outside, so we have that fluid shift. Now, if you want to know about more about how the fluid shifts, there's um, there's go check out the um, congestive heart failure video that I have on my channel here. But we're not here to talk about that. We're talking about CPAP. Okay, so the pressure in the mass changes, which changes the pressure in the airway, which changes the pressure in the alveoli, and that moves things okay it'll either move the alveoli I can't say that right yeah the, the air sac to pop it open um, or it'll shift the water across the membrane of that alveoli and push the water out so CPAP absolutely can be life-saving most of these patients that get CPAP have fluid in their lungs and they are literally drowning if we can move the fluid out of their lungs, it's no different than pulling them out of a swimming pool and giving them air to breathe again. Okay, I mean, the schematics are a little different, but the end results are the same. Okay, it is not permanent. So unlike giving them a medication to help them breathe better, 
if I give them CPAP and it doesn't work, I can take it off. And we move that air pressure right out of the airway system and we're right back where we were. If I give a medication, I can't suck that stuff back out. So although this is um, a game changer, works faster than medication, a lot of cases works better than medication, um, it's low risk. And that's what makes this amazing. And it's super easy to use. Okay, you can see this mask down here has got a little head harness, same one that we saw on our patient earlier. You put it on, works fabulous. Okay, however, here's the but. Okay, things we gotta have. Our patient has to be alert enough to manage his or her own airway. Okay, like we said, this device does not ventilate for them. So they gotta be. Um, I use the following commands. If they can follow my commands, um, then by golly, they're good. Okay. They also have to be breathing on their own, which kind of makes sense. If they're following commands, they should be breathing on their own, but we'll just re reiterate that this doesn't ventilate and they have to have an adequate blood pressure. Now, the reason for that is, remember we talked about, it's going to increase the pressure in the airway. Well, a good chunk of that chest cavity, that upper chest cavity, is lungs. So when we increase the pressure in the lungs, we're going to increase the pressure that's pushing against the vena cava. Now that vena cava brings blood back to our heart. That's a supply line to the heart. If the blood pressure of our patient is low, the blood pressure in our vena cava will be low. That makes that makes sense, okay? Um, if there's not much pressure in the vena cava, it won't take much additional pressure in the chest to maybe compress or collapse the vena cava. So we do not want to run the risk of restricting blood flow back to the heart. If that happens, then we've just we've just killed our pump. Our heart can't pump blood that it doesn't have. And if our heart can't pump the blood, it doesn't matter if our patient is breathing. Okay, so typically we look for our patients to have the same blood pressure as we would if we were giving nitroglycerin. 100 systolic is what most systems use. So I'm going to check a blood pressure before I want to make sure my patient is breathing and following commands. Okay. Now, here's some things that I might see. Okay, number one reason that we use CPAP is in congestive heart failure patients. Like I said, again, we're not talking about congestive heart failure. There's another video for that that I think you will enjoy if you have interest. Okay, But with congestive heart failure, we see a few different signs and symptoms. And one of them is crackles or rails, same sound, in the lungs. Okay, Because when the heart isn't pumping correctly, fluid will back up and because the body's always trying to balance, it will move some fluid because of pulmonary hypertension. It'll move some fluid into the alveoli and the tissue around the lungs. Okay, That puts water in our airway, makes our patient feel like they're drowning, and it makes it very hard for them to get the gas exchange, the oxygen carbon dioxide exchange into the blood. And so our patients are hypoxic. They are struggling to breathe. You're going to hear crackles and rails. And sometimes they're even, as they're breathing through this fluid in their lungs, they're coughing up a frothy sputum uh, that's caused from moving air through that, that fluid in their lungs. So that is the number one thing. So crackles is the big indicator here. Crackles in the lungs. Now that's easier to say than it is to hear. So if you're not good with your lung sounds, practice up. Okay. Other conditions that um, are not as predominant, but we might consider using CPAP uh, would be a drowning. Now, some, some systems are saying if we have a drowning or a near drowning, we pull someone out and they develop respiratory distress frequently with crackles in their lungs that CPAP might be something to consider, okay? So you're gonna follow your own protocols on this. 
but these are just considerations, okay? Um, and check with your medical director and use your protocols, okay? Another one that CPAP has shown to be effective um, for quite a few patients is pneumonia patients that also have crackles, okay? So sometimes with that infection in their lungs, they will develop a little bit of pulmonary edema, and that's the tissues trying to um, react to that infection process and develop a little bit of crackles. So CPAP won't fix the infection, but it will move the water out of their lungs and uh, sometimes increase their oxygenation and decrease their work of breathing. Okay. Uh, the other one is pulmonary edema uh, from blunt force trauma. So if you get a patient that was hit with blunt force trauma, frequently likes to, let's say the steering wheel in a uh, head-on motor vehicle collision. So if they hit the steering wheel, that injury to the tissue in the chest will cause swelling. And sometimes we'll get um, pulmonary edema, water in our lungs because of the swelling. So in this case, CPAP will help. You must be very, very careful and make sure you don't have a pneumothorax. So this one's very used with caution. And then this one, very much with caution. Um, there's some data and evidence that shows that um, sometimes inhalers and nebulized albuterol are not enough for an asthma patient. So if we can't if we can, and we can sort of combine the CPAP with a nebulizer, okay, now nebulized albuterol needs to be in your scope of practice to do this, um, but you can combine those two, and the CPAP helps drive that albuterol a little deeper in the lungs so that it works better. You gotta be really careful with this though, because asthma is an air trapping disease. And when we provide CPAP, sometimes the patients will tell you there's a little bit of a resistance when they try and exhale. Well, asthma traps air in the lungs. So if we're making it harder to exhale, we could make the asthma worse. So this is not a treatment for just asthma, um, but it is a good, I don't know, we kind of call it a uh, turbo nebulizer, okay, if you will. It does help that... Um, medication get down farther in the lungs and can be beneficial. Again, you're going to follow your protocols and you're going to visit with your medical director to know what he wants you to do in those situations. Okay, now a couple little other thoughts. This little guy here I googled tonight and on one of the popular EMS um, supply companies, that little dude, uh, it's all-encompassing, all it needs to work um, is the oxygen tank and some oxygen pressure. That little gizmo right there is completely disposable and it's $39. Now, that takes away all the excuses of why we can't use CPAP on our patients. Um, that's cheap in anybody's book, okay? So, um, as of today, that was the price. And that's the only one I Googled, so, um, you know, they vary, but uh, very reasonable, okay? Now, we've talked briefly, but your assessment is vital here. You have to know what condition your patient has. You have to know the signs and symptoms. If you are not listening to lung sounds and you put CPAP on, shame on you. I'm going to slap your hand, okay? Lung sounds are vital. Assessment is vital. We have to take a blood pressure. We have to know that the CPAP is not going to hurt our patient, okay? Now, secondly, thirdly, whatever this is, if I'm going to put this big ginormous mask over my patient's entire face and seal it there, and it's going to put a little bit of positive pressure in there and make it harder to exhale, I might have to talk my patient into this because if they already can't breathe, the last thing they're looking at be excited about is putting a mask over their face and then strapping it to their head. You can see this goes all the way around their head. So try this, okay? Talk to your patient, tell them, you know, I am 99% sure this is gonna help you breathe as it opens up your airway, okay? So here's the deal. I want you to hold this up nice and tight to your face and give me 10 good deep breaths. 
If you don't like it and it doesn't help, we'll take it off. If it seems to be helping and it's getting better, then we'll go ahead and strap it on so you don't have to hold it. Okay. I find patients, if they know they have control, are willing to go for it. And most of the time, if they've got crackles in their lungs, man, within 10 breaths, they're starting to already feel the difference and they're okay with keeping it on. And then by the time you get to the hospital, they aren't gonna let anybody take it off because it's helping so much, okay? But explain to them very briefly what it is, that it's confident it'll help them, and that it is completely reversible. We will take it off if it doesn't work, okay? Now, once you get it on, and your patient breathes with it, and we're starting to see some improvement, go back and check your blood pressure. Go back and check your oxygen levels. Go back and check your lung sounds and reassess, reassess, reassess. We gotta make sure that our treatment is helping the patient and not hurting the patient. We can't just slap this on, pretend it's all gonna be fine and move on. That's bad medicine, okay? All right, lastly, if you have access to waveform capnography, okay, um, use it. Now that's, you're gonna have to know how to use it. You're gonna have to know how to re read the waveform, but that will confirm your suspicion about this patient and help you make better use of your CPAP. It'll help you determine, yes, is this a good, good patient that's a good candidate for CPAP, or is there a chance that this is not going to work real well? So again, that's a whole nother subject, but capnography is fabulous. So if you don't know how to use that, we need to get you educated. All right, guys, that's the down and dirty of CPAP. I hope it helps a little. I hope it creates some questions and creates you to go want to know a little bit more. Have a great EMS experience and go out and be awesome. And Thanks for listening. Hey, if you like the videos, feel free to subscribe. If you um, have a comment, I love to hear comments. So leave me one and have an awesome day.